say hello and welcome to question corner number 16 in which we are going to be answering questions and also talking about the Kamala hack days that happened last week um featuring uh three people that we uh, have come to know and love in the Kamala community myself Neil and Sebastian um now let me do the usual introductory slide that I do this time because we are talking about the Kamala hack days I have decided to talk about the greatest hacker movie I think it was a close second to The Net with Sandra Bullock, but Hackers is, uh, is the movie I went for. And uh, to introduce myself, I am Niall Dehan, developer advocate with Commanda. I am joined by Neela Ullman, who is also my colleague. Neela, do you want to say hello? Hi. <laughs> Thank you very much. And of course, a special guest and first appearance on the question corner, uh, principal developer with Optimize. It is uh, Sebastian Stamp. Hello, glad to be here. Marvelous. So um, we are going to be talking about the Hack Day presentations. I'll discuss more about that or the Hack Day projects. I'll be discussing more about that shortly. But first, during the course of this, we are going to go through a whole bunch of projects, and frameworks, and all sorts of fun stuff that's been made. And if you have any questions about what you are seeing, we will try to answer them. Uh, what you can do is you can either scan this lovely QR code on your phone, or I'm pretty sure that Stacy or someone like that is going to post a link, already done it, have they? Uh, I post a link uh, to uh, do that. And um, you can follow that link by clicking on it instead of using QR and basically add some questions there. We will stop periodically to look at those questions. You can either answer, ask a question of your own by simply putting it right there. Or if you see a question there that you feel particularly strongly about, you can always upvote that question and we will then um, uh, get to that eventually. So that is the course of events, and I'll be keeping an eye on those questions as we get along. So please do enter those. The questions that you ask are important to us. We will absolutely do our very best to answer them. If we can't answer them right away, we will try and give you some links in the YouTube video below um, as a reference to the question that I couldn't answer. So in the future, you will get some kind of answer. So please do send us some questions. Now, those of you who don't know, we have a very important question that is probably on your mind, which is what are the Commander Hack Days? Um, now, luckily for me, we have a Commander Hack Days expert and longtime Commando here to explain this. This uh, very important question was not left to me, but instead I'm going to ask uh, Sebastian Stam to please give me an introduction to what the Hack Days are. Yeah, gladly. What are the Commander Hack Days or what are Hack Days in general? And why are we doing them? If you have not heard the term hack day before you might get a very wrong idea because it's not about hacking someone or cybersecurity or getting into your girlfriend's facebook it's about rapidly trying out ideas and build something cool or maybe even useful so why is it called hack days because uh, we software engineers if we don't understand the solution or if we look at the solution and say who wrote this then this is called a hacky solution there's no testing there's no code quality just someone tried to make it work at every cost and so it's called the hack days because we are trying out new crazy ideas and just making them work why is this so cool because well, for me, it's because no product management is involved. It's really about the creativity and the innovation of everyone, right? In our day-to-day -day lives as developers, we have like this roadmap and backlog that product management in co collaboration with engineering decides on and we commit to, we want to build these features for our next release. But I think everyone who works on a product also has their own ideas how this can be improved. And these hack days are a very good opportunity to try out some of these new and crazy ideas and some of the things that have been de developed in the past as part of hack days then went on to become a part of Kamunda because we can use this innovation, this drive of improving our products that comes from the developers themselves to build better things in Kamunda. And it's not about building shiny new things only. Of course, this is what's always getting all the attention and shiny presentations. And we are on stage or on Zoom and going to, to you live and showing, oh, we built this nice little plugin that makes everything explode. And that's awesome. But also, there are projects that improve our life at work. 
for example, automating internal processes. Every business has some also boring processes that need to run. So for example, absence management, people need to be informed if someone is, uh, is sick. And these processes can also be automated. And hack days are a perfect opportunity to also work on the such boring processes that make our life at work easier. I will maybe give you an example of, the, of what such a hack day project can look like. As Niall already mentioned, we had the hack days um, last week. This was a three-day event where we basically under the premise of build something cool and maybe useful, uh, went to work and then built something. So as Niall said, I am part of the Optimize team. Optimize is our big data application. So aggregating all kinds of information from different sources or process engine, and then you can create nice reports for them. So for example, here I have a report and this is all the process instances in this process definition that apply to this filter here. So Optimize is really a very, very good at giving you um, data, right? So in this case, 196 process instances. But what does this number really mean? Is this a lot? Is this not enough? How does this number reflect our overall business strategy that we might have defined? This is the context that you need to have in order to interpret this number or any number Right. For example, this bar chart, what, what does this mean? Without the context of what is the setting here, this data is pretty meaningless. And if I create such a report, it's cool because I have this context information. I know what the business is about. But for every company with more than one employee, the problem is that other employees also need to have this kind of context to make sense of the data. So we have like weekly status updates or monthly all hand calls and their optimize is not really used i mean we have dashboards to give a little bit of context or so have more information just on the screen but what happens is the business people have their own tool to convey important business updates they create slide decks with important business updates and then they have slides where they can take the data that they got from Optimize and in integrate it into their slides. So for example, here we have uh, 37 new customers, Q2. This comes from Optimize. We have nice uh, pie charts or bar charts, and we augment them with the context in this slide deck. Now, if I'm a very busy person as a boss of a company, I might not want to make all these slide decks myself. I know I have the slide here, very meaningful slide, and I want to have a heat map here of the latest definition. So I might give the slide deck to my lovely assistant and say, please add a heat map of the latest definition here. And then they have to go to optimize and see, okay, we need the heat map. This is the heat map report. Now I need to make a screenshot. So I open up my screenshot tool and then I make a screenshot by selecting this area. And then I have to uh, copy this and go back to the slide deck and add it here. And this is too small and I make it bigger here, um, but then it's too big and then I need to make it smaller again. And do you see the problem here? The problem is not that the heat map now looks ugly. I'm sure if I can make better screenshots, I would have made it, uh, it might look better. But the problem is that someone has to manually go through this instruction of taking a screenshot of this heat map and edit it to this PowerPoint slide deck. So if we go back and uh, see, we have already this instruction here, please add a heat map of the latest definition here. So my idea was if we make this uh, machine readable, so for example, if we say we want to have the data of the heat map report here, of course the, the report is called heat map. And then we say here in this area, you might not see it, but there's actually a also very badly screenshotted bar uh, line chart visualization here. I remove this and just add a shape and say, please here add the line chart report. 
All right. And this I do for every of the screenshots I have prepared a little bit here. So here we want to the bar chart. And here, for example, we just want the numbers for Q2. And this way we can make use of the very powerful design features of uh, PowerPoint, like different colors, making it bold and stuff. Unfortunately, I don't actually own PowerPoint, so I just download the PPTX file from uh, Google Slides here. And then once I have this file, which I hopefully get soon, here it is, then I can go to optimize and I have all the reports here in optimize already. They are live updated because this is the part of optimize. New data comes in, reports are updated automatically. And then I can just say, I want to process this PowerPoint file. This is what I just uh, downloaded. And then in the background, Optimize looks at every slide. Is there a reference to a report that I know and replaces all of these instances with the report content itself and then creates an optimized PowerPoint file. Again, I don't actually own PowerPoint, so I need to upload this to uh, Google and then we can have a look. And once this is uploaded, we will see that we actually see the data that comes from Optimize in the slide deck. Hopefully, live demos are always scary, but I tested it before. So that means nothing can go wrong, right? Here we go with the slide deck. And we see what was previously at these placeholders have now been replaced with the numbers or the charts. The heat map actually looks good because it was not a human that took the screenshot, but a computer that could take care of the correct dimensions of the thing. And uh, the line chart is actually visible <laughs> as a line chart. And overall, it's first faster and produces better result. And um, I could uh, code it in, in the hack days and had a lot of fun doing that. And that's uh, what I did last week in the hack days. That was really amazing. Uh, I, I, I've actually, I saw you present that before and even seeing it again is so very, very cool, Sebastian. Thanks for that. Um, cool. So um, I'm not sure exactly how I can follow that, but um, I'm going to try. Um, but before I do, there's two quick questions that Sebastian might be able to answer about the hack days. Uh, two of them, one from Uva. Uva saying, um, were the hack days this year remote or online? Do you remember? <laughs> They were both remote and online <laughs> and not yeah. on site, unfortunately. I think some people actually went on site. Um, so in the hack days, you can always build teams and team up with uh, several people to tackle bigger projects or uh, have work or work around the clock. And uh, if all the peoples are in one location, they could, of course, team up. And some people went to our um, hub in Berlin to work there. But you were also completely free to work remotely. Um, cool. We have another question here from you, which is, uh, it's very specific. So prepare for a yes or no answer, I assume. How did you do this? <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> So how did you? How did I do this? Oh, this is this is an interesting uh, question. I can go on for for hours about the technical backgrounds for this. So please stop me if I go into too much details. The first idea that I had was basically I download this PPTX file, parse it with JavaScript, and just replace these strings here. Like uh, I know this, I can evaluate a report and optimize. I maybe I find the string in the file, and then I can just replace it. Uh, and then I would be done in half an hour. Fortunately, it was not that simple because it turns out it's a binary file, uh, this <laughs> PPTX. You can't really do string replacement. Uh, but what I found out is uh, that you can actually rename this file um, to a dot .zip. Yes, and then it's a zip file and you can extract it. So if you extract your PowerPoint presentation, takes a while you see that there are a couple of files there, for example, slides. And the slides themselves are XML files. So for example, what, what's an interesting slide? Maybe uh, we can uh, take a slide two and open it. Oh no, uh, open it maybe in a new tab. Here we go. 
And this is basically your PowerPoint slide as an XML. It's uh, quite long, but here you, you can do string search. So I can do NTSQ1 and I can then uh, replace the string Q1 with the report evaluation result. This works fine for single number reports. For like charts, uh, it's a little bit more complex. I think on slide six, there were some charts because these are not texts that you can replace, but they are images, right? So uh, I think it was called uh, picture, is slide six actually correct? Yeah, it should be. Um, so there are elements here that then have a reference ID to another file where it's specified uh, where the image file uh, lies. And then you find these images somewhere here too. I think it's in uh, media. And there you have all the images that are in your PowerPoint. So you just have to render your report, your chart report as an image, put it in this directory, uh, adjust the references to that, uh, create a little bit of uh, picture elements. And once you have done this, you can zip it up again, rename it to PPTX, and then you have a PowerPoint file. That's actually kind of useful information. Uh, I didn't know you could do that. That actually could... I can see a lot of the uses for uh, just renaming the file and take, stealing. Something. Yeah, that's actually very useful. For example, if you're like me and don't own PowerPoint and need to modify your PowerPoint presentation, just uh, open the zip file and uh, um, do it with the XML editor. Yeah, it's who, who doesn't easy. like um, changing like, XML in order to improve their presentations? Exactly. Um, cool. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, now I will um, take over very briefly to explain the a fun little project that I created. Um, I also have a live demo, so let's hope for the best. So um, I was not alone in my project. Um, I was uh, given help by um, another optimized developer called Helena. I asked her for a picture of herself in this presentation and she gave me this, I mean, slightly creepy sort of Disney character uh, version of herself. Um, now what we did was we wanted to um, create a self-reporting process. That is a process that can create reports on itself. Now, Optimize doesn't have um, um, uh, an API just yet, but all we needed was a really small amount of stuff to get this working. We needed a command platform to run the, the process. We needed Optimize, of course, to run somewhere. We then found out we also needed BPMN to run the model. Then we needed Robot Framework to do the RPA section. We also need to use Java 11 to run Commander and optimize. And we also use Python 3 to run the RPA framework. So very, very easy, very, very few requirements. We made it work anyway. And what we, ha what we uh, happened in the end was we had a fun little project that could report on itself. And I'm going to try and demo it right now. So um, the first thing is this person is going to go to uh, start a process and they are going to uh, log in because that is important security. And they're going to optimize automation. They're going to put in their first, their, their username and password. Don't tell anybody, please. And how much work do they want to do? They want to do exactly two work. And then we click start. Then they can relax. Meanwhile, we have a worker here. This is a Java worker with some embedded robot framework robots. I'm going to start this up. And this is going to register against the engine. And then it's actually going to pick up the external task, it's then going to run the robots in order to open up Optimize, first of all. And it's then going to go and see if the password that we gave was correct. Now, the there we are. The window is opening now. So uh, this is the robot just grabbing uh, this and just pretty straightforwardly going to the right location, trying the password. If the password is correct, fantastic. So it closes down. Now, if the password was not correct, it would actually throw a BPMN error then. And we could then ask the user to enter a different password and then try again. Now, a new robot's gonna open. Um, this is going to actually build a report on itself. So we go back to optimize, we log in with those credentials. We then click, go to create a report. We select the uh, process. We then, we, this is going so fast. So what happened there was we created a report and we also got a link. We created a shareable link for that report which we're now going to open and then read the result of that report. This is, a, it makes present live coding much easier when you don't actually do any work, I just realized. We're going to log in again, why not? And we're gonna read that number, number 21. 
And then we are going to say, have we done enough work? We have, so we are done. Now, what's going to actually happen behind the scenes? Well, let's open up the model and let's take a look. So what's actually happened here is we have started our process. We log into Optimize. Then we basically create our report. We then um, uh, return back a, a shareable link to that report. So for instance, if I go to uh, one of these, I can maybe show you in the variables, we probably have, there's the, the link. So if I copy that, I can just give this to anybody and they should be able to see the report. Great, number 21 is there. So that means we then actually open up that report here. This, this robot opens the report and then scans it for the data. And then if we've done enough work, we finish. And if we haven't done enough work yet, we actually start this process again. And that will increment the number of instances and it'll continue forever. So it's kind of a fun thing. Uh, Backend wise is, um, now I would like to stress that Seb Sebastian very kindly mentioned the hack days are not about creating something that is in any way close to a best practice or in any way close to something I would suggest anyone does. But I have an external task worker written in Java here, and I have a bunch of robots as resources. Now, I don't code in this. This is actually Helena from the Optimize team. She actually wrote all of the robot framework stuff pretty much, and I just stole it. And then I created a wrapper for it, essentially, of an external task because I didn't want to have to implement stuff. Um, so then this is horrible to show, but I actually, the way I run it is I just have a command line that I run. Uh, as you can see here, that I just create a little string so that I can run. Um, that and then it runs and then each one does that and then I can deal with it in Java, a language I actually understand. So yeah, that is my um, that is my wonderful um, addition to the world. So uh, I, I hope um, <laughs> I hope people enjoyed that. I mean, um, that's really interesting. Now, but well, thank you. follow up question: Why did you decide to go for like? Did I understand correct? You built a Java external task worker to start Python in that external task worker, you know that you can also have an external task worker written in Python, right? Would that, that not reduce a little bit of your... So yeah, the caveat is that I know Java pretty well. <laughs> and I also know the JavaScript external task worker really well. So I could do things like access the API in a way that I already know. And I don't know Python very well, unfortunately. And so, and also I wanted to use Jython, but Jython only works with Java 2 point something. Um, and I wanted to use Python 3. So yeah, Python 2 point something. And I want to use Python 3, so I couldn't actually use it in this case. So that's why I ended up actually uh, wrapping it all. It would have been so much easier to use the Python worker um, for sure. But also this way I have um, a whole bunch of robots uh, that are inexplicably in a single uh, worker. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's how that worked. Um, I, of robots, uh, you mentioned that you used a robot framework. Uh, why did you do that? And uh, are there any alternatives that you have could have used instead? Yeah, so that's, a, yeah. Alternatives is a very good term for that actually, because robot framework was chosen partly because of Naila's expertise. And Naila's actually explored quite a lot of, um, uh, of RPA tools and has dived into robot framework. I have actually played around with automation anywhere and UiPath, and I still have scars to prove it. It was a real pain to get those working. So I just didn't bother. And Nela has actually shown me her, uh, and, she has, and Asko, who's actually in the call, he's built some really cool stuff that I actually draw on as well. Um, and uh, also at a few other things. So there was already loads of examples. Another thing is I could wrap all of this RPA thing in one Spring Boot application. And I actually couldn't do that with uh, any other RPA tool that I came across, they would have required me to have a whole bunch of other stuff hanging around, which I wasn't really interested in. So it's a much cleaner, much tidier thing I, I enjoyed using. And, and the best thing is I didn't need to learn it uh, because I, uh, uh, Helena and my team did all the actual uh, bot stuff. So that was quite good. Uh, that was also a useful side effect. Um, yeah, so I will like throw it over to uh, Neela now. Um, um, oh, well, we have one more question. Actually, yeah, so we have, yeah, I uh, from, wanted to say we have that one more question we should answer quickly. <laughs> yeah, so the question here is, uh, the hack is open to everybody, including the community, or are they actually come with the core developers? Um, so I guess the answer is that it's it, this this particular hack day is just for Komunda folk and the developers and consultants and whoever in Komunda wants to code and stuff. We do have a tendency of throwing together sort of um, hack day-ish. We used to do it all the time, actually, have community hack days in particular, and Komunda folk would join that as well. 
So keep an eye out for that. We'll try and do it the next chance we get. So um, uh, that's the best we have for you there. Um, how long have the hack days been going on for? Um, as long as I've been with Kamunda, Sebastian, you've been with Kamunda a little longer than I have. Um, I think the earliest, so I, I was also joining Kamunda in 2014, but I think the earliest hack days were actually 2012. So we oh, have wow. been doing it for a very long time. That's cool. Okay, I didn't realize that. I know that they've been doing it since I joined as well, but I didn't know it was that far back. Cool. I will throw it now to uh, Neela to uh, talk about her little project. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm going to share my screen for that. And yeah, I uh, have not a live demo, unfortunately, but you will understand why a live demo is also not needed here. But yeah, let me introduce my team. So I was not alone in my Hack Day project uh, team. I was not standing alone, so to say. I was joined by my colleague Adam from the cloud team. And we both have a history together because we worked on generative art projects before. And so our project was in this sense um, a little bit different because we did not start with something from scratch, but we started or we, we built something on top of what we had already. And um, I just like to give you a brief introduction of what we had already. So the general idea about how we wanted to generate art was that we took the um, canvas library from JavaScript and in that library, we defined um, symbols, like, for example, a square, a circle, a triangle. And we coded already this um, controller for it so we could use it. And then in another project or in the first iteration, we try to find combinations of all those symbols um, and also wanted to see what kind of different parameters we can give into the, into the creation of generative art to maybe um, compare it or combine it with something we all know. And in the end, we had, or what we did is we parsed a BPMN diagram. And from that BPMN diagram, we took parameters and we used the parameters to um, make combination of those symbols. Um, and of course, um, if that is not enough already, we build a process for that. So we had a process to generate art out of a process. And we presented this um, this year in the Kamunda Summit. And if you want to watch the presentation, um, I included the link here, but we can also post it in the chat. So when we started with the hack days, this year, we were like, oh, it's so long ago that we um, did our generative art. We really want to go back to what we did and we want to create more patterns and more templates for generative art. And um, we said everything that is related to circles, we want to learn in this um, during this hack days. So circle was a symbol we went for. And my particular goal and story with this circle was I wanted to bring small circles into the big circle. And my first attempt kind of looked like this. And maybe you can see now this was not really working. I did not have the right formula. Um, I had more like the idea of a square and putting like squares in circles does not really work. But luckily, Adam, he had more or he paid more attention during his mathematical classes back in university. And he came up um, and showed me a nice formula that you can use um, to calculate actually outer points of a circle line. So um, with this in mind, he immediately went and said, OK, now we can build circles and circles. And this was uh, what Adam did after explaining me in the formula. I tried out the formula and um, well, it did not work out directly, I would say. The first attempt looked like this. It's better than the square, I would say, but it was still not circled in the big circle. And then I thought, okay, now I have it. Now I really know what I have to do. And then the next attempt looked like this. It was more like, now I have all the small circles outside of the big circle, that is also not what I want. But luckily to mathematical logic, if you multiply this minus one, you end up being here and then you have your circles or the small circles in the big circle. And that's what I wanted finally achieved. And in the end, we added also colors and patterns. So I created two new templates looking like this. And um, Adam also created his templates, um, which were obviously the one circles and circles, but also he created this really cool um, looking, um, yeah, uh, circle thingy, but circles and circles are not chaotically ordered, but um, with, different, with different colors. And that was basically the idea that we came back to generative art and were finally able again to paint with code. 
if you want to check out the project, we have everything on GitHub as well. Um, and yeah, happy if you want to see it there. And that's it. So Neela, are, are, is your next step triangles? Like where, where do you go from here? Yeah, maybe putting triangles into triangles, right? I mean, it's so hard if you start Googling generative art, you see so cool stuff and you're just like, oh, I really want to get there. And um, yeah, I think we will improve a lot. We were planning to use different parameters so that we don't use the information from BPMM process models. But the next step is we want to use information from GitHub. So for example, GitHub has a public API. You can give your username, you get some uh, statistics about yourself and then maybe we use those as uh, input to give you your own personalized generative art of your github account profile that's very cool that sounds really good i'm looking forward to seeing how many circles are in circles uh, if i put my github repo in there uh cool thanks so much Nila. Uh, so uh we've gone through uh three projects that we created we're now going to go through just some of the favorites because loads of other projects existed we can't go through them all but we'll go through some of the ones that we all enjoyed um I'm, i've asked um uh everyone to kind of look at the projects and pick some of the ones that they quite liked while we're not going to demo them here because they're not our projects necessarily anything you see here uh, we actually do have a slot every Kamundicon where the developers or consultants or whoever who built the projects will actually demonstrate those live. And so if you're interested in some of the projects we quickly run through now in the next 20, 30 minutes, then um, yeah, sign up to Kamundicon. We'll give you a link at the end and you'll see these things uh, in, in action. So um, Sebastian, do you want to let me know what kind of stuff that you saw from the um, hack days that you quite liked? Sure, there were a lot of projects that I quite like. I also like, especially also Nela's project because it combines this uh, part of technology and art, right? The, these images, you can uh, get them printed, hang them on, their wall, on the wall, and then you have something tangible that you created. And uh, it's related to technology and art in this kind of hybrid way. And there was one other project that I really enjoyed that also uh, did go into this direction. And this was a project uh, by Ralph, Leonard, and Patrick. Uh, operate engineers and also from the infrastructure team, really a team effort. And they went ahead and built BPM and clots, which are like tangible BPM and building blocks. I have a couple of screenshots. I can't, of course, not go uh, through the presentation itself. But what they did was they um, had these tangible blocks that you can touch with your hands and rearrange on a table. And this was then recorded with a high resolution webcam and automatically digitized as a BPMN model. So they really could play around with OpenCV and these uh, little markers, uh, kind of similar to QR codes and modeler plugins and uh, computer vision. I think right now it's not um, using machine learning, but the idea is to also maybe in the future include TensorFlow, object detection. And in the end, this is something that's really very diverse, right? You can use different materials. Uh, I think these are uh, laser cutted uh, with engravings, laser engravings. Also, I think 3D printing was part of it. Um, and also paper, of course, you can combine it, right? Here we have a paper printout of some symbols and uh, you have these um, laser cutted and engraved symbols too. And this in combination with the technology of having a webcam that records everything and then automatically transfers it to um, a model. This is something that was very cool. I especially liked, uh, it's also a great team effort. Right, you have someone who really likes 3D printing and doing all this physical stuff, and someone then likes uh, computer vision algorithms who can then write the de detection, and then you have someone who write, who likes to write modeler plugins, and you bring them all together in a team, and then uh, you can create something really, really cool. Also, it's about learning new technologies, right? Uh, I mean. I have not found a use case for computer vision while working in Optimize yet, but uh, the hack days always provide a very good opportunity to do that. I think this is a photo of the setup here. You can see the webcam and all the, uh, all the cutouts that they have used for their project. Uh, 
And also, of course, paper prototyping. You can just print it out on paper. It's very cheap. You don't have to start with like a very expensive laser cutter, just try it out on paper before. And if it works, then you can upgrade from there to the more fancy uh, materials. Here you can also see one example of the 3D printed uh, one of the marker. But I think the, the laser cutter worked the best. That's the first project I have here. Do we have any questions? I'm not sure if I'm uh, authorized or even able to answer any questions regarding this project. <laughs> but I think, I if you, try. yeah, <laughs> I think if you if we have any questions, the best people to answer with people presenting at Comunicon. So um, I think there'll be opportunity to probably see uh, a, a, an even a really interesting example of this at the next month at Comunicon. I think. Yeah. Um, so if you're interested in seeing that, but I love this. I totally agree with you, uh, Sebastian. So many technologies and so many people from different teams in this project that I really love that kind of scenario. So thanks. Yeah, definitely. So go check out uh, Comunicon next uh, month, um, where some of the projects that we also showcase here uh, will be presented. Second one, uh, I have two uh, projects actually uh, found because there were a lot. Uh, the second one is from uh, Joe Papas, our senior technical consultant. And this is about gun charts in Kamuna cockpit. So this is a plugin. And I love plugins. It's one of the easiest and most powerful ways to really customize your Kamunda experience. So what this is, this cockpit, and all of these features that you have here, for example, in these tabs down here, these are all single plugins. And there's a plugin point where you can add your own functionality. And this project did that and basically built a better way of this audit log. So the, the question you want to answer is what is what was going on in this single process instance? So we here we have process, uh, it's completed. We have this audit log, so we can see this task was started at this time stamp and then ended at this time stamp. But it's really, really hard to read. So uh, Joe built a plugin uh, to introduce Gantt charts. And this is just another uh, visualization of this data. Here you have a very expressive and easy to understand flow of this process. You see when was this task started? When was it ended? What came after that? Um, why is this so cool? It's immediately clear why this is useful. Right. So if you just look at these two screenshots here, I would much rather look at this than the first one here. So and thanks to the plugin mechanism, you can already use it. You can uh, go to GitHub and uh, download the code and install it. And then you have it in your uh, Kamuna cockpit, too. Um, other projects, for example, also my project, it's in Optimize. Optimize does unfortunately not have a plugin mechanism yet. So we have to wait until product management decide that PowerPoint export is really a useful feature that we should build. Until then, um, this is not yet available. But this Gunshot plugin, you can install it uh, right now. Also, what I liked about it, it's really, really hacky. Right. I had a look at the source code. I think in one line, this was just a, a 10,000 line, uh, 10,000 character line, which is, was just a minified JavaScript library, which was a little bit adjusted because there was a problem with the, uh, with the granularity of the, of this axis here. And this is really what, what I say. This is what hack days are about. Don't, you don't need to care about code quality. Just copy this library in your source file in a single line, make some adjustments. As long as it works, everything is allowed in these kinds of projects. And that's wonderful. Cool. Thank you so much, Sebastian. I actually, uh, it, it reminds me of like, I think uh, ASCO created um, a, a, like a, a Jupyter plugin for Cockpit as well that shows like reports as well. And it's like a hundred megabyte download for a plugin, which is perfect. That is exactly what you want. So um, I'm going to uh, actually talk about what I um, came across as kind of interesting as well. Thanks so much, Sebastian. I'll come back to you shortly. So let's swing back over to the presentation, which I should have had ready. But there we go. OK, so um, hopefully everyone can see that right now. Yep. So that's my project. Let's go into this. So the first one is um, uh, Discourse uh, BGMN plugin. Oh my goodness, this is the this is, saves me so much time. I love the Commander Forum. 
Uh, I know from the list of people who are joining this call that you do too, and I've spoken to you on the forum multiple times, but the forum has some issues. For instance, people very often describe their processes in text, which is, you know, fine, I guess, but it's a lot easier if you upload the model. So you can see here that I have very often, this is just in a, I just did a quick search, I ask quite frequently just upload the model. The problem then is once you upload the model, well, you still need to download it and still need to put it in the modeler to see it. It's a real pain. So Macek, who is part of the modeling team, um, very kindly took on this uh, task of making uh, this wonderful creation, which is a plugin for the forum that if you upload a VPN or DMN file, you can actually uh, go ahead and um, visualize it, open a, open a preview of it. You can go full screen and you can also navigate around it. That is so handy. It is so useful. We are going to add it to the forum at some stage. It's still a little bit janky, uh, but we're going to try and add it to the forum to see if, it, if we can make things improve. But I really love this uh, project. Uh, and I thank Macek a lot for actually adding this. It's a really, really great example. And it's, uh, of course, open source and available for anyone else who has a forum out there, a discourse forum that they want to plug VPN into. Um, my uh, uh, Another uh, great plugin, uh, another sorry, great project came from Martin Stam, the CCC. I saw this on the, um, on the, uh, the list of projects. I didn't really know what it was. And then Martin very kindly explain the harrowing journey he once had with customer service that inspired him to create this project. Martin, Pearl Martin, he was attempting to fix a Kindle. And of course the Kindle wasn't gonna work out. And you, they actually wanted him to phone a human being. And he realized what a terrible experience this would be for anybody because it's a lot of work, but luckily they can phone you back. This inspired Martin to create a tech support a process for Commander and a plugin for task list in which you can go, and this is anyone who wants to call Martin, you can do this whenever you want. You just put your name in there, just ask Martin a question, and then you give him your number. And when he's ready, he can call you. Very, very easy. I'm not sure he, I did ask him when this goes live. He gave very vague details of exactly the date where it actually is going to go live. So um, I'm going to have you going to stick with me on that one. But from his end, once you uh, go to this front end and send your name, number, and phone number, then Martin demonstrated how he can actually just uh, get a little task list plug in with this button, this button down here that at the moment says hang up. Initially, you can just click that button to uh, give that person a call. And actually, Martin then demonstrates in a very tiny um, picture up there that he actually got the call during the demo uh, during the week. So we have a task list plugin that allows you to make phone calls directly. Um, while I don't have all the details about how this works, uh, I do know that uh, we have task list that we have a phone. And basically, Martin created a plugin in task list that does a local gateway thing. And that subsequently uses some of this. I'm still I've stolen this slide directly from Martin. So I'm actually not sure why I'm pretending I know what's going on here. But it follows all of these lovely uh, pictures, and then eventually we get a call. Uh, again, I would hope for more information from uh, Martin. I think if uh, uh, whenever he displays this, as it talks to this and um, come on to come. But I thought this was a great presentation, uh, a really great example of something that has almost no use outside of the hack days. But I found really really fun to. <laughs> Maybe Sebastian disagrees, but I think uh, a really uh, a really cool project, a really nice um, prototype, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I actually have a third one that I want to talk about really quickly, which is from uh, the wonderful uh, the, the the wonderful dream team of uh, Zell and um, Osler. Philip Osler and uh, Christopher Zell are both um, developers on the ZB um, team. People might know. Um, uh, They've done a whole bunch of stuff already. Uh, Christopher has spoken at Comundicon before, and um, uh, Philip Osler is uh, built the uh, Scala DMN feel engine. So uh, he's always in the form answering questions. In this case, what they wanted to do was they wanted to uh, test ZB. Now ZB, when it starts up, it clusters, it does all sorts of stuff. It needs, it needs a container really to be able to start it up to test it. And they wanted to create something called Easy, an embedded ZB engine so they can make testing way easier. Um, 
So they did. They, the startup time for tests went from 10 seconds to about 3,000 milliseconds, which is epic. And um, we have a, a screenshot of what they did here. They basically made the engine embeddable. And uh, so it can actually be started up really, really easily. We see some numbers here on the right about like um, uh, deploy process going from what, three seconds is it? Deploy process here in container is like 12 seconds. So there's a big difference. This is available uh, online somewhere. So let me just show you where that is. So uh, it's available here. It has its, it's already had its second release, amazingly enough, uh, within uh, moments of the first. But basically, the cool things I want to point out here, there's a lot of stuff. It's got JUnit 5. It's got time travel in there, so you can increase duration and stuff, which I think is really cool. And also, you can get a lot more records. See if you can use a black box at some stage. But if you have access to the Java API, you can do a lot more. And also, you can print out a whole bunch of stuff that's happening. So uh, I look forward to seeing what happens with this project. It looks really, really cool. And um, I really loved the, uh, the concept of it, how quickly they were able to create something that DB was not at all designed for. Uh, so that was quite nice. Um, cool. So um, yeah, that's kind of the stuff I want to talk about. There's um, do, do, do. do we have any good templates for web connectors? Uh, will we use robots? Uh, I will discuss that question at the end because I want to throw things to Neela first of all, because Neela also has some projects that uh, she was interested in uh, looking through. Take it away. Uh, cool, thanks. I'm going to share my screen. I'm also not demoing because it's uh, way too dangerous to demo something that you have not built. Um, I also decided to um, go for plugins because Sebastian really explained sometimes it goes into the product, but the nice thing about plugins is it, a product manager also does not need to decide it has to go into the product. Plugins can be used by the community right away. And that's, um, I think, a really cool result from the hack days. And the first one uh, I really liked is um, a do documentation generator for BPMN diagrams. And this was built by um, three consultants, um, by Jana. Uh, who took care a lot uh, about um, who took care about uh, JavaScript stuff in the project? Uh, we had Manuel in there, also from the consulting team, and we had Norbert from the consulting team. So, what can go wrong if you have three consultants? Basically, nothing. So you get uh, a prototype or even the ready plugin in the end. And um, they had the challenge or well, what means challenge, but they were really well distributed. So we had uh, Norbert in Minnesota, we had Manuel in uh, Southern Germany and Jana in more Northern Germany, but they really liked the experience of working so asynchronously together in different time zones. So there was not a big issue um, with that. And um, yeah, um, normally if you think about BPM and diagrams, there are or one reason why we use them is because we want to reduce the amount of text someone has to read to understand what's going on. So that is one idea why a diagram can help you. And um, the group decided, well, we turn it around because if we have a diagram, we want to get back to the text. So we want to get the text back, but not just the text, but we want to have some useful information we can use for the technical implementation. So the idea was, if I have the diagram, I need to get back to the test, uh, text. And what happens if you have um, three consultants uh, in one team, they are not just building one product, they are building two. So in the end, they decided for two implementations and they decided to build a Mudler plugin that was a JavaScript part. So you could, um, or you can use this plugin in the BPMN modeler. And then from there, you get the documentation. And the other plugin they built was the um, Kamunda Platform Engine plugin. So here you need to have a deployable model. And um, the benefit here is it can be auto-generated with a deployment and you get the documentation out here. So both plugins um, have been built. And in the end, yeah, that are the two languages in the project, Java and JavaScript. And the end result is, and I was, uh, someone nicely showed me what the end result is uh, or sent it to me, the end result. It's a um, markdown file where you get information about your process. And this can be really handy. For example, if you uh, want to implement um, afterwards your service tasks, for example, here you can see um, 
the name of the um, of the service task, but also you can see how um, it is implemented in um, in which uh, way. In this case, it's a bean. So um, you get all the information here as a markdown file, and you can use those then for later documentation. And I really like that idea here. Um, another plugin. Uh, and you can find it also already on GitHub. So if you want to check it out, um, you can, can look here and maybe install it already. Um, another plugin I really liked was um, the one that Max built it. And um, that's about template elements modular plugin. And Max um, here as an artist, um, decided to be on a team on his uh, on, a, on his own. And that's completely fine because if you normally have to collaborate with a lot of people, maybe it's sometimes nice to work for three days alone. So that's also completely fine within the hack days. And um, you can find him in Berlin. So he worked alone. And maybe a general idea, what are element templates? So the idea about element templates is if you or in an ideal world, you would have um, some business people who design the process and then they hand over the process for technical implementation. That's the ideal scenario. And sometimes you don't have that ideal scenario. So sometimes you have people building the process and adding the technical elements um, in one as one person. And those people are not necessarily developers, but they need to fill in all the um, technical information. And here element templates can become really handy because those those element templates can define the um, elements in a BPMN model beforehand. So the person just needs to select the template and then um, does not need to deal with all the technical details and has not to fill them in. And that's basically the idea to make the life easier of someone who is in a middle role, so to say. And we find them quite often nowadays. And um, the current process is how is it or how can you use it as an um, end user? So you have to go, you have to configure the task to a task type, in this case, service task. And if there is um, a template for a service task, you then will see here the box which says open catalog, and then you open your catalog. Those are all JSON files um, included in the Camunda modeler. And then you can basically select one of the templates. And if you select the template, um, everything is filled out for you. So that's a basically, or that's the idea about element templates that exist already. And um, Max was thinking what can potentially go wrong here. So um, if you give someone who is not really technical, all those steps, all the clicks the person has to do, um, that person, would find um, themselves in front of maybe just um, five colors. And now you tell the purple, uh, the, the person, now you have to give me the color purple. And this can still lead to a lot of confusion and frustration and too many clicks. And then someone does not want to work with those templates anymore. So the idea that Max had here was let's bring the color, in that case, let's bring the template visible to our um, palette from the modeler and also into the context part. And the result is that you have it now here. So here in the um, palette, you can select the templates. And here in the context pass, you also can already select the templates. So you have less clicks and you will see the templates sooner. And as this is also a plugin, you can also go um, to this repo here and try it out and see um, if that might be something for you. And that were the two projects I was really interested in seeing. Super. Thanks so much, Neil. That was really cool. I did love the fact that we have so many uh, uh, really nice uh, plugins actually that were created. I think you're absolutely right. We see a lot of uh, people building plugins because it's just so easy to, to just stick something to an existing system. Um, so thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, we have about five minutes left, which is ideal. It's almost like we planned it. And uh, for that, I'm going to uh, quickly um, tell you folks about some uh, fun stuff coming up. We, uh, if you like to hack about stuff, uh, why not? We have a Come Under Code Studio. The day before Come Under Con happens, you can sign up for it. Uh, it won't be a free for all hacking session uh, like uh, that we all come to know and love from this presentation, but rather it, you get to actually uh, follow uh, various uh, steps in creating a relatively advanced Come Under project. It's ideal if you have 
kind of tiptoed around Commanda a bit. You kind of know how it works, but you want to really experience building the project from scratch and understanding some of the slightly more advanced capabilities and the different uh, ways of building projects. Um, so that's a nice little getting started experience. Myself and Nayla will be hosting that. Uh, you can register uh, and a link that I assume will be posted on the chat shortly that I really should have let people know that I was going to ask them to do that. Uh, the other thing that's also worth mentioning is, of course, ComondaCon. Yay, we do this once a year. It's a two-day conference where we have a whole bunch of people from around the world all coming. And uh, they, they, well, they used to come to Berlin and give a talk, but now there's a combination of people coming to Berlin to give a talk and people uh, speaking remotely. So um, you, one of the many things you will hear about in ComondaCon is um, the Hackney projects that we just talked about by the people who built them. You'll also get to hear about people in the industry who are using Commanda for various reasons and the use cases they have. It's usually a uh, kind of an architectural level uh, and it'll give you some good ideas on the various use cases and the various people using them. Uh, so you can register, I think it's free as far as I know, unless they have changed things. Um, so yeah, go ahead. There should be a link in the chat uh, at some stage, I, I, I assume. Um, we also have uh, some um, webinars coming up, some meetups. Uh, I think August 20, the Vienna meetup is uh, in August 26th and the Bangalore meetup is September 3rd. Uh, so check that out. The next question corner is gonna be October 28th uh, because we're skipping next month because of um, uh, Kamundicon. So uh, set that date up there. So the next question corner, I think in October is going to be community extension orientation as far as I'm aware. So we will see how that works. Um, yeah. And uh, finally, um, there's a whole bunch of things that happen over the course of Commander's, um, uh, these the months between these question corners. And uh, like, for instance, knowing about some new projects that are, that are showing up in the community, things that are like, let's say, the new features in the alpha release that just happened a, few, a week or two ago. Um, those are all part of the developer newsletter. So if you're interested in hearing about the kind of cutting edge stuff that Kamun is getting up to, as a developer, you can subscribe to that. Um, yes, a big thank you slide. That's always useful. I would personally like to thank um, uh, Nayla, of course, uh, my co-host, and also uh, Sebastian, our guest star, for coming along. Uh, it was uh, incredibly uh, 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 kind of you to, uh, to join, Sebastian. Thank you very much. Uh, and we will all see you next time. One thing I should mention, this recording of this whole talk, along with all the links to all the projects that we can possibly link to, will be uh, put on YouTube on Monday, probably, depending when I get around to editing it. And you'll find all the stuff you'll need right there, um, along with the timestamp stuff to know what projects are which. So yeah, uh, thanks again. And it is, well, look at this, we ended a minute early. So enjoy that minute, and uh, we will talk to you in, hopefully, at Comunicon. Bye-bye, everybody.